Uh, welcome, everybody, to episode 13 of Believers and Non-Believers in Discussion. We have made it to year two. So I want to thank everybody who... Everybody who's been involved, everybody who's come on panel, uh, everybody who's watched online, you know, I think this is a good thing for at least us, hopefully for a little bit broader audience than that, hopefully for society in terms of demonstrating how we can talk together about things that we disagree with at times and, and to understand each other to, to that same end. So um, I've got a couple of announcements on that end. The, there is a podcast that we're starting up. Basically, it's the content you have here. If you go on iTunes, it just came up this week. Um, believers, non-believers in discussion. If you just type in believers, non-believers, you'll find it if you do a search on it. Um, I'm going to start with the uh, episode one content and then just put up a, a new one every two weeks until we basically get caught up to what we're doing now. So uh, if you want to see the whole series... Um, that's the way to do it. It'll be about eight months until we catch up to what we're doing now, and then we'll decide if we're going to continue on once a month or possibly go uh, more frequent with that. Um, I will say that the, the, the costs of what we're doing have gone up. The library here is upping their fees, so I'm opening up a Patreon page um, to help that. Uh, I will tell you more about that next time because it's not quite ready. Be ready in about a week. And we just want to keep these things going, too. So uh, more news on that as it comes along. Let's see. So today we're taking a look at the secular growth in America. And this is really an issue around the, the demographics that have just evolved over the last, say, 20, 30 years. So um, I've given everybody a document from uh, PRRI, which is the public who shoot Public Religion, Religion something Institute. Um, and I don't know what the third letter is, but you know you can look it up. It's online as a PDF, so you can find it. Look up PRRI um, research, um, and it kind of gives us a standard to, to a set of numbers to work from. I think the data is from 2015, I want to say. So the, the, just to throw one number out there, the... Um, the, the nun group, which is the, the non-affiliates, uh, it's kind of like the catch-all leftover group, except for the uh, people who didn't answer, which is like 2%, is 24%, and that includes atheists, agnostics, um, spiritual people, and people that uh, are not going to a specific church but have, don't want to claim to one church or another. So there, we'll, have, we'll probably hit that point in a little more detail as to how the nuns are broken down a little bit and how that might affect things. I'm interested in looking at how this shift is affecting culture now, um, the somewhat the genera generational change, and to see if what people's opinions are um, on what's going to happen going forward. I don't know. It's kind of a, it's, it's, it's an open topic, and, and to some degree we don't know where it's going to go, so we'll find out in... 20 years and come back. Let's reconvene in 20 years. <laughs> Make that commitment. Get your phones out. Put it on your calendar. <laughs> yeah. And if I'm not here, I, I'll make sure I get myself uploaded online and we'll just have <laughs> that little character speaking for me. So let me go left to right this time. Um, I've got four very good panelists. Um, on the left is Jen Ramirez from uh, Riverside Atheist and Freethinkers. Uh, been involved in the atheist movement for quite some time now. Um, Michael Kane from uh, CFI um, Center for Inquiry. Um, also, he does a podcast, Free Religion, and most recently, you can hear him on the Dogma Debate radio show. Um, he does the news segment on that show, and he's also sometimes part of the panel with with David Smalley. Um, to my right is Ryan Moore, and uh, to his right is Larry uh, Bymill. Perfect. Yes. Larry Bymell <laughs> from True Grace Church. Uh, Larry's a first timer. We met at the at the Redlands Market night, and I, I appreciate you coming out. Oh, it's so my pleasure. It's, uh, we had some good conversations. Um, again, friendly conversations, and I'm all about that sort of thing. So. The format here is uh, everybody gets to start with a maximum five-minute opening statement, which really is a position statement, um, uninterrupted at this point, and although people can rebut at the 
bah, at the end of that, and then we'll get into conversation. And um, I hope everybody brought some questions for the other side. We'll keep going from there. Okay. So just to be random, I'm going to start with Ryan. Okay. So go for cool. it. Cool. Well, today's topic is the growth of secularism, I guess, in America, correct? Yes. Wording that appropriately. So um, my opening statement is basically how how is that affecting our society? And our society um, was – or America was based upon – our religion and God. And I mean, if you look at the, oh man, now I'm blanking here. What is the, um, we place our hand over our hearts. It's the national, not Pledge national. Pledge of allegiance. Anthem. Pledge of allegiance. Thank there you. you. So our Pledge of Allegiance, it says, in God we trust, right? I'm not supposed to oh. comment, so <laughs> just go ahead. Okay. So it, it's basically saying, hold on. I pledge allegiance to the, fl the flag of the United States of America and for the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, individual with liberty and justice for all. Under God. So God is at the base of what we were teaching our children when I grew up. And that was only, you know, 15, 20 years ago. Um, I'm 32 now. And I remember that Pledge of Allegiance. And I remember when we started getting away from the Pledge of Allegiance, trying to get the under God part taken out of our Pledge of Allegiance. Now, that was about 15-ish years ago, somewhere around there, where it started happening. And when that started happening, we could see a dynamic change in our society. Our society is now, every single day, you can look at a huge tragedy. This morning, there was something that happened in Texas, where uh, someone came in and shot up a church. Why is this happening? Everyone goes, why is this happening? Oh, gosh, why is society so terrible? Some people can say, oh, you know, it's, it's it happened over time, and it's only because of media, only because we have social media where everyone's connected at every single point where we know exactly what's happening at any given time in the entire world. That's part of it, sure. But it's also a part of us getting away from God, getting away from thinking, oh, you know what, whatever I want to believe is okay, and, you know, my beliefs are my beliefs and all this stuff. But if we start taking our eyes off of God, start taking God out of the equation of our day-to-day -day lives, that is where this stuff happens. And you look at, look at what happened today, yeah, there's no surprise to me at all that this stuff is happening. You look at the bombings, all this stuff that's going on, all these terrorist attacks, I'm not surprised at all. I go, yeah, of course that's happening. Why? Because we're moving away from God. And that is the biggest reason why. Okay. Uh, any, any quick rebuttal or comment? I don't want to go too long with the rebuttals, but any quick comment on that? No, I, I pretty much got that in my Um Okay, then the, the, there's a correction in there. So does anybody want to make a comment on the placement oh, of God in the pledge? I'll, just, I'll to, just, to, just to put that I, one. I have it. Okay. Uh, Terrific. Yeah. I will come. Okay. Let's jump over to Jen. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Go for it. Okay. Um, I was going to use this opening not to really hit on a position per se, but to kind of go into a little bit of history of secularism and sort of what it is and where it came from and kind of how we got to where we are now, uh, which will cross over into Ryan's topic here a little bit. Uh, traditionally, skepticism, or sorry, wrong topic. Uh, secularism is defined as a form of opinion which concerns itself only with questions, the issue of which can be tested by the experiences of this life. More recently, the term tends to relate to religious and governmental separation. The first real mention of secularism, ironically, was from the character Jesus in the Bible, where he is quoted as saying, render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's, and unto God that which is God's. Jesus was basically saying, hey Jews, pay your taxes to the guy that's on the money. But in a wider view, he was sort of speaking of how matters of the earth and matters of spirituality could be or should be kept separate. This teaching was not lost on theologians like Thomas Aquinas, who distinguished between a good man and a good citizen. Not to allow for too much separation, however, Romans 13 says you should only obey the authorities because they were placed there by God. For centuries to follow, kings and rulers set claim to their authority based on such scripture, after, uh, later relying on the Pope to reaffirm their appointments. Eventually, this got out of hand when Henry VIII, who named himself the maximal authority of the church, making a, the country a theocracy. This motivated waves of religious minorities to flood into the new Americas. 
With more than 25 different sects now populating the eastern coast, secular governments was a matter of practicality. Later, when formally founding the United States, the Founding Fathers were sure to include secularism in the First Amendment with two clauses. Quote, Congress should make no law respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, or abridging the freedom of speech of the press, or the right of the people to peacefully assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. Not only was secularism not a primary push from the non-believing minority, it was the Danbury Baptist Association that prompted Jefferson to coin the term wall of separation as they were concerned that the con Congregationalists of Danbury would trample on their minority rights. Jefferson assured them that they were covered by the earlier mentioned clause. Other documents, such as the Treaty of Tripoli in uh, 1797, which very clearly says, the government of the United States of America is not in any sense founded on the Christian religion, enforce this mentality. Secularism itself slowly spread to other nations with France in 1905 and the first Muslim nation, Turkey, in 1928. In the mid-1900s, though, Russia embraced a form of overreaching secularism which overstepped its bounds by attempting to limit religious freedoms and its practices by its backwards peasants. In a misguided response to the atheism of the Soviet Union, Americans began to distinguish themselves as godly and thus began the erosion of secularism in the United States. The founding of National Prayer Breakfast in 1953, adding of the words under God to the Pledge of Allegiance in 1954, and establishment of a formal motto, In God We Trust, to replace the informal yet more inclusive motto, E Pluribus Unum, from many, one. In 2014, 53% of Americans said they would not vote for an atheist candidate, whereas in the UK, 33% of politicians are openly atheist. When Christian Tony Blair was asked to comment on the divine, he simply said, we don't do God. While most democracies still don't do God, in America, the profession of Christian belief has become an informal test for most governmental offices, something the Founding Fathers would likely have protested. Okay, very good. Within your time, thank you very yeah, much. My pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> With time it's the only thing spare. I wrote, so. <laughs> um, Larry, I'm gonna jump to you. <clears throat> wow. Um, I'm not going to address the, the whole government thing. Um, the, the question was, why is secularism growing? And uh, I believe because the church has done such a horrible job of uh, relaying who God is and our relationship with God. I think the church is the biggest enemy we have out there. Um, and so what I do and what I've been called to do is to preach the gospel. Um, and that's to relay truly what the Bible says, not to enforce it upon anybody else, not to make anybody else believe it, not to condemn anybody else who doesn't believe it. But my job is to just go out and to show the love of God as I understand it. If you don't believe it, that's, that's fine. Okay? Uh, am I surprised that secularism is, is happening? No. Why would you go to an institution where they tell you how bad you are every Sunday? Or you're going to go to hell, or God's angry at you, or if you don't watch it, the mighty smiter is going to swing out of heaven and smash you. Um, none of those are the God that I know and the God that I worship and the God that I see in the Bible. And so um, would, I, would I like to see God in the government? Yeah, but not the God that comes out of denominations as they teach it. Uh, that would be scary to me. Uh, um, so I'm not surprised it's happening. I, I really don't want to address the, some of the little individual things, get into a side argument. But So that's my thing is I want to show who God is, as I understand it in the Bible, and it's totally different from what I was raised with and what I grew up with. So am I surprised that people don't want anything to do with God? Absolutely. Why would, why would you want somebody who says you're bad or you're a disappointment or uh, because of your ideas or uh, your beliefs that he's angry and he's going to condemn you? And the church goes out and has condemned people. And so that's not what we do. That's not what the Bible says, as I understand it. So are you saying that, the, that some churches today are putting out the wrong message? Absolutely. As, as you're not saying that it comes from the secular side, but it, it, they put out the wrong message <clears throat> and that, that God uh, says you're bad, 
people don't like to hear that, so that turns them away from. If if you go to a, a school, and the teacher every every time you come to school says that's good, but you need to jump an extra inch okay. higher, and so you're never quite good enough, or you're never quite there. What does that do with you after a while? After a while, you're either going to fake it, or you're going to rebel against it. And so we're seeing a rebellion now in, in the younger kids who were raised up under either Catholicism or a strong denomination where it was very legalistic, where they told you, you know, if you lie, if you this or that, and corporal punishment was involved with it. <clears throat> They're rebelling against that today. And so that's what we're seeing. We're seeing something that started probably in the 50s, manifest in the 60s. So now those people in the 60s are the, our mommies and daddies are us here today, and they don't want anything to do with the religion of the 50s or, or older. And I think it's the church's fault. Okay. And and by church, obviously, this is a very broad statement. It's a very broad many, brush. Many it's doing a very, very broad brush. Many but different I, types of I would of say work, majority. But, okay. In my opinion. Um, comments on this side to that? Well, no, I mean, yeah, I, I would just sort of bring up if you're saying it feels like it's the church's fault that secularism is in growth. Um, what would you what would you suggest that the church could be doing better i guess you're saying like the formalized larger entities it sounds like are the it's, ones that sort of it, got off path it's not a quick answer okay if you want the answer i'd be more than happy to give it to you i think we got like four hours right <laughs> really okay cool um if i was to tell you okay over every one of our courthouses is the ten commandments okay and and we say oh that's what we based america on you know judeo christian belief well, nowhere in my Bible does it say I, as a New Testament Christian, am supposed to follow the Ten Commandments. So why would I do that? Is it a good moral standard? I shouldn't kill people, you know, and I should respect my parents? Absolutely. But, and I'm going to say everything from a, a Bible understanding. So when I read the Bible and, and the Apostle Paul writes, the law came to show that we, in ourselves, there's nothing good and we cannot, uh, we cannot bring ourselves back to God in our own works, our own abilities. So the law came to show us our shortfalls. Once we understand that in ourselves there's nothing good, we don't need to do the law. The law is done with. And so Paul also writes that the law literally stirs up sin. So when you tell your kid, don't touch the flame, what do they do? And so that's what we're teaching in church. We're teaching them, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. So none of the law, everything from what we call the law of Moses, does not apply to me as a New Testament Christian. So if we take that off the table and we go with the book of Acts forward, now what is Christianity? And I got lost. Oh, back to your answer. Uh, so... So if, if I tell you as a Christian, so the, the pretext for a Christian, what are the qualifications for a Christian? Uh, Jesus died on the cross for me. He paid the price for all my sins. I put my faith in what he did. I'm born again. So that's all my qualifications. There's nothing else beyond that. Trust and belief. So the word faith in Greek or Hebrew really means I trust. Okay? So that's all I'm supposed to do. Now after that, it's a growth where I'm learning how to operate in this world, how to walk in love, how to walk in peace, and how to do those things. That other stuff, which every church I know, denomination teaches, doesn't work. It bears no fruit. And I can show you scripturally where, you know, the, old, the, the, the covenant of Abraham is totally different than the covenant of Moses. Mm -hmm. And you can't mix those two together. So when Jesus talks to the, uh, you know, you can't put new wine in an old wineskin, you know, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. You know, a little bit of leaven or a little bit of legalism or law will ruin the whole batch. That's what he was talking about. So are you suggesting that people, the church does not teach out of the Old Testament? The Old Testament, it, if you say the Old Testament, you're talking about everything from Genesis to the last book in the Old Testament. Right. The law, starting with Moses and Exodus, there's typologies in there. So you can teach out of it, but I don't follow that. Define typologies, please. A type, well, you know, I was raised in San Bernardino, and I graduated from San G, so I probably say a lot of things incorrectly. I'm, I'm not an English major by any standard. A typology. Am I really a seed? Is Jesus really a lamb? No, those are typologies. There are metaphors there. So that's what I mean by that. So when I look at the Old Testament, I can see 
the coming Messiah and certain things like Joseph is a typology of Jesus. Moses can be a typology of Jesus to an extent, but he's not the real thing. Okay. Well, what I'm wondering is because a lot of what people have troubles with, trouble with comes from the Old Testament, some of the Absolutely. Old Testament rules. So can you just sort of drop that out? I mean, people would disagree on with that. They can you. disagree so, all you want, but I'll show you biblically that I'm not under the covenant of, of Moses. Jesus said, I fulfilled the law. And in the grammar, that is perfect tense. In other words, he came as a man and he followed the law and was perfect. Scripturally, the law, the Bible says that the life I now live is in Christ, hidden in God. And so I, Larry, am not keeping the law because Jesus did it for me. So therefore, I am already perfect and pleasing to God. Now I'm learning how to walk this life out in my poor little flesh. Over here. Question? Comment if you have, otherwise, a question. Um, I guess my question for you is, do you feel like you have to keep deviating from your faith? I know you keep saying, I don't have to follow the Old Testament, but it seems like the more you strip away that's the only way you're going to keep anybody around. Like that's, that's, I think that's the way that you're going. That's how you're adapting. Strip away, only keep the pretty parts and the beautiful parts and the love parts because we don't want to associate with that because we know that that's what scares people away. You know, um, sorry, I'm kind of a, um, <laughs> bear with me there. So for me, from this perspective, it just kind of seems like you're just deviating away, stripping away whatever Christianity, whatever it was. And regardless of that, it's multiple things anyway, um, you know, just to be able to keep it. That's how you've adapted. And that was actually going to be one of my questions is how do you guys, with the shift in, with the nuns coming, you know, coming more forward, is how do you guys try to keep them? And the only reason, and the only thing I'm really hearing is I have to stay away from it and and take away all the ugly parts so that people only see this parts. But there's a lot of beautiful parts into the Bible, and there's a lot of beautiful parts that were, that had, that existed prior to that so to me as we see it dwindle it's kind of a nice thing in that, to watch the religious scatter to try to keep it going because i don't think it will for very long i think christianity is on its way out no but because you have to you have to clarify what christianity is christianity is the religion religion is religion religion is a man-made thing christianity is a relationship Okay, so I have a relationship with God. We can argue all day long and we could walk out of here and you can say, man, I kicked that guy's butt. I still have a relationship with God. That You can't take that away from me. The problem is people don't understand the written word. They don't understand the Bible. You have Abraham, who is the covenant of faith. You have Moses, which is the covenant of we can do it. If you go to the book of Exodus, somewhere around 19, Moses is told by God to bring the 70 elders up on the mountain and he's going to talk with them. Okay, so the 70 elders of Moses go up on the top and in the scripture it talks about that they're literally in the throne room of God and they have lunch with Jesus. Okay, that's the descriptive words. Okay, and when they're coming down, the 70 elders say, this guy scares us. We don't want to deal with him. Just give us some rules to follow and we'll be more than able to do it. Bam, next morning they get the Ten Commandments. Bam, the next thing is doing, they're having big orgies and a big uh, debacle going on in the camp. How come none of that happened when they left Egypt? How come none of it happened in Egypt? How come none of that happened with Abraham? Abraham was a covenant of faith. So when God came to Abraham and says, Abraham, leave your people, leave your country, and follow me, Abraham did. The Bible says that because Abraham trusted God, it was credited to him as righteousness. So I'm under the covenant of Abraham. I was never put under the covenant of Moses. So it's not picking out the pretty parts. It's picking out the parts that I live under. If you want to live under the law, you can. But under the scripture, it says if you live under the law, you'll be judged by the law. So I'm not under the law. Never have been. Mike, anything? Oh, not yet. I want to. I want to shift back to a little bit to to the reasons of secular secular growth. Uh, when because I went through um, uh, a, a recent book by by Kevin McCaffrey, who's actually going to be here next month on the point of morality. I invited him to this panel. He just couldn't make the date. So I I pulled some stuff out of his book that I want to throw out and get everybody's response to. Um, this the 
the science shows, meaning you know, people being brought in and, and given surveys on, on both sides of it as, as to what um, causes them to continue with their faith, what causes them to change their faith, what causes them to, to uh, change or keep the road they're on. Um, there is, they found what he calls a loosening of culture. Um, now let me define these things a little bit because the terms were a little odd, loosening and tightening of culture. A tight culture is one where there's um, restriction with more restriction within the culture. Uh, there's more, more more rule following. There's there is more control over what is um, proper behavior in term in terms of um, definitions of um, what is uh, acceptable behavior. Those types of things. And then the opposite of that would be a loosening of culture, where where things are becoming are less strict and there's right. some shifting back and forth. Uh, in cycles, and some of it certainly happens based on um, uh, things that just happen. Like obviously, 9/11, you just saw the culture tighten up real, real quick there, uh, and get very fearful. And well, we have to do all these different things to make sure that that uh, we're safe. There's there's a fear-based element that drives the tightening also. Um, he uh, let me sort of paraphrase quote here. He says when culture loosens people perceive a greater freedom of behavior and personal power. These are the antecedent foundations for secularization. Um, any comment on that of, you know? When, when culture loosens, people perceive a greater freedom of behavior and personal power. Um, they feel that they can do more of what they want to do without being told here's a specific type of rules or, or, or set of life that's the proper life to live. And these are the antecedent foundations for secularization. And that seems to be what's happening on, on a broad level over the last couple of generations. Where has that gotten us? I'm just, I'm just throwing it out there. This is what this, this is what the science is right. showing us. So uh, a yeah, good example I, of that is Judaism. I'm not here to answer that question. No, it's, so. it, it's like the nation of Israel. You, you go to Israel and they'll say, I'm a Jew. Are you a secular Jew? Are you a religious Jew? Are you both your mommy and daddy were Jewish people? So what is it? So in America, we had people who, well, my mom and dad went to, you know, to church. And so I'm a Christian. And that's that was their relationship. They they went because mom and dad went. Okay, and so we're seeing that break away, and so people now are saying, well, I only went because of this, and so now they didn't have a relationship. They didn't, you know, they didn't like what went on in church or whatever. And so I see that happening of a loosening up of the culture, yeah. where in a lot of negative things have come out of that, uh, because we were trying to legal or um, we were trying to make laws to keep morality, and and what people as soon as you put a law in, what do they do? They go do it anyway. You know, prohibition didn't work. You know, the war on drugs didn't work. You know, all, none of those things work because people go out and do things that are not beneficial to themselves, usually because there's a hurt or a pain or something, instead of following a law. So. Well, law also pairs up with enforcement. So it's the, it's of the, what? Uh, with enforcement. So yeah. if, if the enforcement is not well done, then yeah, then right. the law is rather pointless. Right. But, so it's not, so so, I'm not, it's not just the law. Um, so, I, so where has it gotten us? That's, that's kind of not the point because it's like this is what has happened. So where do we go from here might be a better... Okay. Where do we go from here with, with this whole idea of us as a society just branching out and saying, hey, well, you know, this doesn't work. I want to kind of do this instead. Um, if, if we're allowing all these things to start um, kind of going whatever way anyone wants, then you're getting all these weird archetype of people where you cannot just help them. And that's what I'm kind of, you know, that's what I feel like I'm here to do. I'm here to help people. The Bible, yeah, I can sum up the Bible in four words. If you want to hear the Bible summed up in four words, it's love God, love others, period. That's it. If I follow those two simple rules, and Jesus said it too. Someone said to Jesus, how do I follow all these things? He says, love God, love others. That's it. 
if I have love in my heart, if I speak to people with love and not condemning, like you're talking about with the church, yeah, there are a lot of churches that do that, but you know what? There's a lot of churches that uh, speak the word of God and they teach love. That's one of the churches I go to. Church I go to, that's all it is. It's it, You can hear the pastor every week say, no, we love him here. We want to show people the right way to live and a better way to live. If your life sucks, it's not that hard to change it around. It's just the fact that people don't want to change. That's the core issue. People don't want to change. They only want to do whatever that feels good to them, whatever is right to them. And so this whole thing of, hey, you know, if, if you want to call yourself a transgender, if you want to call yourself gay, if you want to call yourself whatever, if you want to believe in nothing, if you want to believe in something, all these rules that we had, yeah, and a lot of it doesn't work because like what you were saying too is when you tighten a lot of stuff down, a lot of people rebel against it. I have a ton of friends who grew up Christian with me, grew up in church, and they started rebelling because their parents were too strict. Well, guess what? People aren't perfect. I'm not perfect, you're not perfect, no one's perfect here. But if I sit here and say, hey, you know what? I just, I love you no matter what. If we disagree, hey, you know, we disagree, that's okay. But as long as I teach the word of God and whatever the word of God says, and I love you in doing that, then everything's gonna be okay. Now it's not gonna be the best, but it's gonna be okay. And it's gonna be a lot better than what we have now, where what we have now is, there's no rules. At this point in our society, we're like at, at a very close line of martial law. We're at a very close line of we can, uh, if, if someone doesn't do something, if something doesn't step in and help us, our society is gonna crumble. And I mean, yeah, it's not gonna be right this second. It's not gonna be tomorrow. It might not be five years from now. But if we keep going down this path, it's a slippery slope. It's something that will take hold and we're gonna see a lot of rules change and it's not gonna be for the better. Mike? Yeah, wow, there's a <laughs> I know, I went on a no, bunch okay. of tangents. It's okay, I, I have a lot of thoughts uh, <laughs> behind a lot of that stuff. Um, I, I would first off say that uh, you definitely sound more Old Testament than your partner. Um, Not at all. It very much sounds like the, well, they need to do what we say the rule is or we'll just change it for them. Uh, we will make the laws that tell them what is good and what is bad because we have some sort of divine knowledge of what that is. Uh, I, I don't feel like that's a thing that actually occurs in reality where no one can sit down and say, all right, let me just sit and pray and think and I come up with the right answer for something. You know, you don't sit down and get divine knowledge of how to become a surgeon. You actually go to school for decades, right? Like it's, it's, a, long, it's a long process to get there. Uh, I don't know that anybody can sit down and say, A, that we're in a lawless society. I feel like uh, if you look at law code, uh, we have more law now than ever in history. Um, I also don't feel like we're in a state of martial law. I feel like maybe we're in a state of turmoil, uh, I think would be a better term for it. And without the fear mongering concept of we have to change this, uh, you know, per God's law, uh, we can actually sit down as people and talk about what works for us as human beings that we can actually show through, uh, you know, research and development and historical sciences and things and be able to actually say, these are the things that are actually good for human beings as an animal. Uh, these are the things that we do well under. Uh, these are the conditions that we don't do well under. Uh, and to try to build a structure around what's actually good for us as opposed to what we would moralistically like to enforce upon others. And uh, Jen, looked like you had some comments too. Well, yeah, and I think a lot of it is you're paying like a picture that we're just really bad, terrible people and that we need a God to change that. And, you know, you couldn't be further from the truth because a lot of stats come out now that the most secular states out there have, you know, have the least violent crime, less child abuse rates. So the more secular places actually are doing better in that regard. That's you know, their own. That's their own thinking, though. No, that's actually coming out as we actually have stats. We have our own thing. It's your thinking. If you're going to project that type of thinking and that we're all just violent people, think about that. We are corruptible. There are good people. There are good natured people. Right. Sure, but we're all corruptible. We're no matter what, we are sinners. And you know what? Like I said, I'm trying to sit here and say, I'm not perfect. But you know who is God? God's perfect. And when I believe in him and he paid for my sins, then I don't have to worry about anything else. Now, whether there's secular people who are better than that, I don't care, 
really. A lot of that doesn't really matter to me because... Um, then how much of what you said about loving everybody, you should care about how good people oh, are. Yeah, I, I do Because care. what it sounds like is that both of your churches are whatever type, and I think yours is just a little bit more behind, is that you guys are embracing humanism a little bit more, which is What do you mean just by being humanism? Good, being just good people without gods. You guys are looking at it from a secular standpoint. And you know, not, you know not I mean? even... Not even, not even close. I'm sorry, don't play with the wire. Just because. Like, it, no, it's, it's no, no. It's it's a misinterpretation. We can disagree, but the idea between humanism and being just good without gods is is a concept to be good for goodness' sake, without being fearful of not being able to attain salvation, not fearful of a god that's going to damn you. I, I think maybe where she was kind of spinning too was if your principle is just love everybody. Right. How do you and, do that? Well, no, I, I agree. It's a you can't. very difficult thing. I don't think you can it's, love everybody. I think inherently you're going to not like concept. some people. Uh, that, that's a, I think it's a very honest statement to make. Uh, I also think, though, that if you believe, which I'm going to make the assumption you guys believe in literal heaven and hell, um, if you do, then I don't know how you could ever take up the position of they can do what they want. Mm -hmm. They can make whatever decision they want to make. Because now I knowingly have in my head that they are going to burn in hell for the eternity if they do not do this thing. Uh, and I feel like that's a very polarized position to be able to say, everybody can do what they want. Please come love Jesus. But you can do what you want. You're going to go to hell. Not my problem. You have the concept backwards and not wanting to disagree with you. I can't love anybody unless I understand how much God loves me. Because I can love somebody and I can say, you know, I don't like the shoes that person has. They cut me off in the parking lot. Everything in the world is now. Do you feel like loving their shoes is loving them? No. Like, it, do you feel no, like that no, would no, be an attribute I'm, I'm for saying, loving somebody? I'm saying I could look at and there could be anything that could annoy me or cause me not sure. to love somebody. Sure. And so when I receive the love of God, which is unconditional once I put faith in Christ, yes, there is a, a receive or not receive. Absolutely. That, that's, that's a given. But it's the love of God that causes men to change their minds. The whole sin thing, and, and let me just explain where I'm coming from. The word sin in uh, Greek has two connotations, no part of or miss the mark. So when Jesus was talking about sin, it's usually a noun. When the Apostle Paul is talking about it, it's a noun. And that was the separation that I believe happened with Adam and Eve in the garden. That was the separation. So when I put faith in Christ, I'm not separate anymore. So the whole thing about sinning under the concept of the Ten Commandments, that's, that's not biblical, okay? Are there consequences? If I go out the door and I rob a bank, will I go to jail? Absolutely. Am I still saved? Yes, I am in the context of what I believe salvation is, okay? But I can't love people. I come in here and I already know there are people who just adamantly disagree with everything that I believe in. Now, I could come in and argue and say, you're all going to hell, damn you, okay? But that's, that's, not, what is, that's not what's in me because I understand how much God loved me when I was broken, okay? Um, my little come to Jesus moment really happened at 40 years old when I was in San Bernardino. I was a full-fledged crack addict living on the street. And I'd been raised in the church, but it didn't work because they kept telling me I needed to do something, do, 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 do. And it was really understanding of who I am by putting that faith in there. So one day I cried out at 40 years old and uh, I got delivered from the drugs, didn't have to go through rehab or anything. And my life after the last 18 years has done nothing but get better. But it's not in rules and regulations. It's a relationship. So um, I would not say that society needs to have more rules. They need to have less rules. I would say the, the thing that will change society around the anger, the, the people who want to go into a park and beat each other up over a statue of something that happened 150, that's insanity to me. Where's that anger coming from? That anger is coming from some type of rejection or some type of hurt that's inside of them. And so when I come, the last thing I'm going to do is preach guilt or shame to somebody. I'm going to tell them about the love of God. Now, you can receive it, yes or no. And yes, I do believe there's a literal heaven and a literal hell. But the concept is not to say that you have to earn it. You just have to believe it. So 
that's where I come from, and you can argue with that. that okay, part, but that's, that's your prerogative. I, I, I want to get away from this this discussion of <laughs> yeah. Actually, Phil, why, I kind of wanted to kind of get away from just the why, biblical relationship talk. I actually talk right. about statistics and, and, oh, and the about why, trends. Yeah, yeah, why why I believe that's a different topic, and we keep shifting back to that. I, I do want to get into the. The secular growth. I mean, we have we have a world. Well, okay, you you take it. You, <laughs> yeah, I was yeah, like, we're kind of we're, well, I'm like, we're, talk, we're talking from, a little too much about panel, that. Not me, so. <laughs> and uh, yeah. Um, Go ahead. So let's just kind of get right into it. Christianity's on the decline. We know what's happening. Um, more people are identifying as non-religious, um, and it's primarily among young adults. So you know, millennials are coming out as non-religious, and that's a great thing. You know, just coming, just a couple of statistics, just from 2015 from the Pew Research. You know, back in 2007, about 78% of Americans identified as Christian, and as of 2015, it's gone down to about 70%. You know, um, and where we are rising, kind of what he was talking about in terms of stats, in 2007, 16% of Americans were identifying as atheist or agnostic, and now we're, I think we're between the 23 and 28%. You know, so it is on the rise. Yeah, uh, actually, um, it's the nuns are 24%. Yep, 24. Atheists are Somewhere. about three. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. So us atheists, ooh. Um, and if you guys, for any of those of you in, that are kind of familiar with Dr. Phil Zuckerman, he teaches out in the Claremont Colleges um, for Secular Studies, um, kind of reading a little bit of his research in the last couple of days. And, you know, the decline of Christianity and, you know, faith overall, is, it's, it's, it's all over the world. It's not just the U.S. You know, for the first time in Norwegian history, there are more atheist agnostics. In Britain, there's the lowest amount in history of church attendance. And get this one. This one was my favorite. Zero percent of Icelanders believe that a god created the earth. Zero percent. So I'm like, hello, can we catch up? <laughs> uh, you know. Um, so let's talk about it. What, what you know? What changes that? What, what, what's happening now in this world? You know, are we also godless and bad? And we're like, yeah, we're gonna go anarchy and run to the streets now. It's not that. The most important thing, and I think why you get a younger generation of people who are changing their minds. Oh, speaking of which, um, it's the millennials that are doing um, really great, and over 35% of them identify as non-religious. So, sorry, you sorry know. Jen, you uh -huh. also try to keep off the wire. Oh, sorry. I'm getting, I'm getting all excited. I'm like trying to get on my paper here. My apologies. Um, so let's talk about why, you know, what do we all have? We all have telephones, computers, the internet. We can type in. Anything about God and anything, we can get all this information, right? So with all this access to this information, you know, people are not going to sit there in the churches and the pews and listen to why gays are terrible and deserve to burn in hell. People don't want to hear that. You know, um, think about socialization. You know, you tend to meet more people who are non-religious. You get to identify who they are. They're actually, we are humans. Atheists are humans. We're actually good people. And maybe atheists will actually raise, you know, less non-believers, and despite, I know, um, Ryan thinking, you know, maybe we're not just the best. You know, right now, maybe we are in a state of turmoil. You know, Trump isn't the, the best thing right now. But, you know, with education and technology, humanity is in a better state. We're not as violent as we used to be. You know, and as we have, our needs are met. Now, not everybody, that this is going to be a little bit more broad. You know, we're not going to be so inclined to be reaching out to churches for help when we're a little bit more sufficient. Um, and you actually touched on it too. It's like the religious right. You guys are killing. Like they're 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 killing the moderates, because as they make you know the pences that want to, you know, I mean, sorry, I'm a fiddler because now I'm getting annoyed. Sorry, I'm one of those. <laughs> We're just take everything. From I know. You. I'm like just take it away. Just take all the chords away. But you know, as a religious right, they're not doing any favors. You know, as they're harping on people, people are like, whoa, 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 this is not who I am, and so the young are going away. You know, and like I said, I mentioned gay rights, and let's talk about 9-11. That was a huge shift right back when once we saw those towers going, we were like, oh man, you know. So there are a lot of things that are contributing to it, and you know, I think one of the beautiful things about that is as we come toward, you know, secularism and non-religion, I think we're gonna gear toward more critical thinking. We're gonna advocate for more science, you know, Critical thinkers, atheists, we're not perfect, and by no means are we. But, you know, we're trying our best, just as we all do, no matter, you know, what situation we're in. You know, um, but a couple things that I was doing, um, doing some research over the, the last couple days, is that it might taper off because Islam is actually going to be the fastest growing religion. And a lot of that has to do with fertility rates. Like, 
and making more babies, right? And I don't know about you, but, well, for many of you, for me, I don't ever want to have children. So my bloodline stops with me once I go in the ground. There is no more, there are no more gens coming around. That might be a good thing. Um, you know, I don't know. So, you know, with our rise currently, it may just kind of taper off down the next, in 2050, we don't know. But as we see the rise of Islam, that's going to be another interesting topic we're going to have to kind of counter. But like I said, in you know, a lot of studies, and a lot of this from where I'm taking this from is from Dr. Phil Zuckerman. Read a lot of his books, um, Society Without God. Those are great, great books to read. Um, studies show that secular people tend to be less violent. We fare better on homicide rates, um, crime, crime rates, child abuse rates, and on every sociological measure of well-being, you'll find secular states to be at the best. Because we push for education, because we push for science and critical thinking, and a lot of us, you know, we tend to be more liberal. You know, we don't care. Love who you love. It doesn't matter. You know. Um, that's, that's the whole there. Uh -huh. Get a little reaction. That's a a, a chunk. <laughs> what reaction would you like, sir? <laughs> I don't know. Honest reaction? No, she's she's <laughs> yeah. stating she's stating the facts as she sees them. That's fine. That's that's great. Um, well, no, actually, I actually have the facts as the, they are. They are. Yeah, and it's and not facts. As I see them. These and, are not my. These no, are not my facts. Opinions. I can go anywhere and get contradictory facts. So facts are facts. Um, and and that that's fine. Um, I'm sorry. You you're discounting the statistics. No statistics because. You know, that's that's an argument where you lose because this guy gets these statistics and this person brings up these statistics, and that's that's fine. Okay. And, and traditionally, I would, I would agree with you. There There is definitely a, a way to build research questions. Uh, I, I used to work for a company that does that. And so they would definitely build questionnaires in a way to get responses that they would like. Um, what these guys have done is they've been very much uh, careful to not you know, sort of beg the question. Right. They don't lead people in. They're literally right. looking at crime statistics, meta-analysis of data that's collected from sources all over the place. Right. Uh, so this isn't just like a couple of secular guys sitting down and going, ah, oh, well, let's show how good it is. Right. Uh, this is meta-analysis stuff. These are things that pretty much any group, if you sit down and look at the raw chunks of data, you sort of have to agree with these statistics. Um, if you want to say these are your facts, uh, I think you fall into that trap of that sort of alternative, you know, fake So news which society has no violence and is totally secular? What society was it well, you were talking about? Well, all, well, all, well, all so no, no society who? is perfect. But no, she was Scandinavia. Thinking, yeah, Scandinavia is a big one. That, that's a creationism it's question. Yeah. No, she was okay. saying, she, she's not saying that there is a direct relationship to people who are secular being non-violent or non-criminal. Um, just just, just that it is rates. a much lower it's rate. Much, much lower, lower rate. Okay. So it's not like how big is Scandinavia? I don't know that it matters. A, a social study of, does. of a couple hundred thousand people would be a couple a hundred thousand. How big is dynamic. America? It's quite large. Sure. That's that statistic. Those those uh, percentages that you're talking about are much lower because there's a much lower amount of people there. I I, I want to just throw out a little bit, yeah. to, a, a little something without getting too one sided Fine. here. Was that uh, I, I know I haven't read Zuckerman stuff, although I've seen it referenced. It, it is somewhere in the range of 30 countries, 40 countries that have yeah. been studied with, I want to say, 15,000 samples, some, somewhere in that range. So it's a significant number. Okay, uh, I was just I mean, asking. Per, perhaps there is an issue actually of population density. For sure. Um, yeah, deviation uh, to the top of my head. The, right. the selection of so, the population for any study is going to. What modify I'm, that study for sure. What I'm curious of, Larry, is from what you said, okay, so on this side is Zuckerman et al. and his his group. Okay. And then you say the other. So what, what would be well, on the other okay, side? Okay, so you're, you're saying that we we're seeing this group, of, what, what this group people, of people group, this people group, millenniums as you use them, who are turning towards secularism. And I'm not surprised, and, and I, I, I no, no, see I, that. No, because you were discounting the, the studies. So no, and I was discounting where the, the comment made was that secular societies have less violence. And that is I would statistically like, and I would like, yeah, correct. But I would like so. to see is that a little tiny country is, you know, because when you start looking inside the demographics of a country, where does the violence come from? It usually comes from the low income. It usually comes from different ethnic groups. It, okay. it could then come from, you know, what their religion is. Is it Islam? Is it Muslim or whatever? So again, it's a you different are, breakdown. You are, you are doubting the, 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 the legitimacy of the study because you think he's taking um, 
No, I'm, say small I'm, countries and, I'm and, doubting and, and, the conclusion. Okay. Well, so, what I'll so do is I'll, I'll, if it's clear, I'll make sure I, maybe I can just send you some some links be, and books so you can take a look no, at but it for yourself. By saying you're, you're, this is your thing, you're saying strictly by secularism, there's less violence and less crime. Yes, yes. I would disagree it's a, with it's that. A, it's a it is a correlation in the data. <clears throat> okay. So I don't I don't and you guys may know this more than I do, but I I don't know that there is causation. Yeah, I don't, I don't think anybody's point, saying there's so. a direct relationship to your religious ergo, you're more likely to be bad. I don't, I don't think that's what anybody's saying. But what I'm trying to get to here is when, you know, okay, so here's this, this data mm -hmm. and you're disagreeing with the, the conclusion. You haven't read it, but you, you know of it now, so right. you can go look at it. But so what's the counter? What's, what would you say would be counter evidence? <sighs> or, or are you just, are you looking for counter evidence or are you just not yeah, I think or, it's or a broad brush to use just the statement that secularism produces the, the violence and everything is down. I would, I would disagree with that. I would want to see some really stats and a broad sampling. Yeah. I, I, I've dealt with statistics where they, you know, and they, okay. they build their picture. So well, one of the just more. So what, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I need to finish this. this yeah, sure. okay. So do you have data on the other side? To, that you can no, I do not. I do not than, have ready facts than, that I can a, throw a, at you. Than a concept that you would like the religious to be less crime ridden, uh, and you would like the secular to be well. No, less I see. Then even the word religion. Well, but you, you get the point I'm making. Right. It, so, I would. I would so, say. So you seem to be reacting just because you don't like. It seems to be a negative for your side. No, because if you if you're going to use that analogy, then then if we say religious people, well, then what is that? Is that Islam, which their main okay. thing is, let's go kill all the Jews and all the Christians. That's that's a very violent religion. Okay, pardon. Okay, good questions coming up. I can hear. So. <laughs> okay, so we'll leave it. We'll leave it at. Um, correct me if you want to add more. That I guess to look into the data to Zuckerman, right? Zuckerman. And um, let people judge from there. Um, unless you can think of anything else in the next hour. And then we can bring exchange out, emails so. later and I can send you links yeah. if, you, if you would like to read the material. Okay. Definitely. So Mike, you were going to say that. something before? Uh, I, I think another like, real world function that goes into this, not just statistical analysis stuff, is that when you're able to say, I am empowered by God to do anything, um, whatever that thing is, it allows you to do a lot more things than you would be normally allowed to do in a society where you have to justify your action in some sort of either moral, ethical, legal fashion. When I can just say, I'll use Islam as your example, if I can run around and blow something up and say, all hail God, um, to me, or, or God's telling me to go do these things, or God is encouraging me to do this X, Y, or Z, whether it's a good or bad thing, without having to go back and actually explain why you're doing the thing you're doing and reason it out in a secular manner, uh, I think it allows you to do a lot more atrocious things in the grand scheme of things. If I was to go by and say, all right, I think it should be legal for everybody to just punch people in the face as you walk down the street, and I say, well, because God told me that's cool. Um, that's not a very good reasoning behind why you should be allowed to do that thing. So if I have to sit down and say, okay, cool, well, it's good for society for me to be able to punch people in the face because X, Y, Z, and because statistics show that this is what makes a healthy society, I, I think that puts you in a much tighter position of having to justify your behaviors. And for you, Larry, when you said that it was kind of God that got you out of, you said you were, you know, you had a drug problem, I wouldn't rob you and give credit to anybody else but you for getting yourself out of that and having the strength to do so, because that's a lot to survive. And I wouldn't rob you of that. I will look at the beauty of your humanity and your strength to pull yourself out of that. And that's a lot of what religion does. It, it, it's either going to, it's gonna hold you less accountable, right? Because how often have you heard people say, oh, you can, I can only have God to be a good person. And I just, I call that out, I think that's wrong. I think you're a good person. I think you did the best you could, and you're doing great right as you are without it. How do you know he's a good person? I don't. I'm just, just I just want. You know I just. I just want him. I'm just hopeful. Okay, so perhaps, you're just perhaps. Hopeful. Yeah. Well, perhaps well, just, because just I like to look at people as good. I don't want to always look at people as bad, you know. But just from his story of coming out of that, I'm just saying that he didn't need a god. He did it himself. But do you do you see the problem when we get into we start judging? Someone's good or someone's bad. Well, religion judges all the time, so I don't do, know. Do you use the word religion again? 
Yeah. That's a Christianity man-made. then. No. Then I'll pick one for you. No. But the, so what I'm trying to say is that I just didn't want, from my perspective, from a secular perspective, I think it's really it's really good that you are able to do so, and I credit that to you. That's all. That's all okay. I was saying. Yeah. What What are the feelings I got from my my rearing uh, as a child? I, I grew up in a very Baptist and Nazarene split family, so that very much fire brimstone Old Testament. Like you know, the the New Testament concept to me does also feel like that kind of uh, New Agey Christian kind of thing because I came from that hardcore old school religion. Um, but I think what we're trying to say is a lot of times it feels like all glory be to God, all failures be to man. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't seem fair to take away all the credit from all the good things you do because you say you couldn't do that without God. But anything that's a failure is because we're fallible, crappy people. And I don't feel like that's a fair dichotomy. Um, I wouldn't. I wouldn't call anybody crappy people. <laughs> I, I, it's my lack of linguistics. Yeah, so. <laughs> I, I have a different slant on. It. I just look at hurt people, and and hurt people hurt people, and they do hurtful things. And sure. so, the whole judgment thing, it, it doesn't doesn't do anything. It doesn't build anything. It doesn't deliver anything. It doesn't set anybody free. It just. So she can call you good, and you can call her not crappy. Isn't that kind of the <laughs> I, same? I would never say she's crappy. <laughs> Aww. No, you can call her not crappy. <laughs> and she's not crappy. But that's okay, because you, yeah. you just criticize her for saying, calling somebody, assuming somebody's good is judgmental? Or did I misinterpret that? I didn't say that. No, I was just asking for clarification. Okay. <coughs> All right. That's Maybe not that was just, mental. just my brain. All right, let's go back to you. Sure. Um, you th- throw, us, throw out something to the panel here. Throw out uh, a you question? Gotta, yeah, throw out one sure. of your questions. I got a question here. Um, I don't know if you know this. I'm a white single, or not single. Sorry, I'm white. Oh, uh, that's no, a I'm married. I'm married. Um, uh. I'm a white heterosexual male, and in this society, within the last, I'd say, two years or so, um, that has become a big talking point. Um, and I wrote down a question of why is it? Because I'm a Christian and I'm a white male. Um, who loves another woman instead of another man, why am I labeled hateful when I just don't agree with something? I, my, my relationship with God, I don't believe homosexuality is correct. I don't think it's right, nor do I sit there and say, you're a terrible person. But because I state that I am a Christian, I am now labeled as a hateful person just because I don't agree with what society is saying. Hey, this is relevant, this is new, this is something good. Everyone can believe whatever they want. Um, That worldview, why does everyone else get a free pass on that? A little off topic. It is, it is, but it was one of those. But it's a good question, so. I think to pose it to a the sort of to the topic to the secularism component, um, I, I don't know what you've said to anybody that gets you labeled as a hateful person. Um, right. So that's sort of a different okay. conversation. Okay, uh, um, I didn't. But uh, what if I voted for Trump? There's a topical thing. Sure. Yeah, I'm not going to get political about it. I don't want to. I hate politics. Yeah. But I can guarantee you, just because I am labeled a Christian, I am, and I've seen it too. You know, last time we did this. You know, just because we're Christians, people automatically assume, oh, we voted for Trump, we're hateful people. Uh, Yeah, I'd say there's probably a lot of assumption um, on all sides of things, but I I try not to denigrate anybody's character by just saying like, oh, you did A, therefore all these other things are true about you. Like, I, I think that's a fallacy. That's a, that's a bad okay, way of that's, thinking. Yeah, I, uh, I, I so, like what so you said. So for you to be a white Christian male that voted for Trump that doesn't like homosexuality, fine. I, I have no problem with that because I like secularism. I like to not write laws based on your opinion of a biblical law. Um, that's, that's essentially what secularism is. It's let me find these other people who identify in a way that don't match your ideology and still allow them to live a life that's free and fair and open. Uh, that's, I think, what we're here to do. But, but, but doesn't secular thinking also write laws? I mean, you know, sure. in terms of... But it goes back to sort of uh, that, that game theory concept, right? It's like when you're writing laws and rules, you don't write a law and rule like, hey, I am somebody who is for, let's say I'm pro-homosexuality. I would not write laws that would benefit homosexuals over others. So the concept would be um, to come back and say, how do I write this rule or this this game law of 
a, a fair set of rules without knowing which player I would be. Right. So if you don't know who you are in the game, that's how you write the rules to be a little more fair. Right. So if you sit down and say, all right, I have these preconceived notions of what's right and wrong and I'm going to write my laws about it and it's going to impact individuals and I don't know which individual it's going to impact. I, I feel like that's a little more open. Let me, let me complicate this a little bit. Sure. <laughs> so um, when you have an oppressed group to what well, doesn't even matter what the definition is, but an oppressed group and an oppressor. Um, wouldn't it be, I'm not sure if it would, is it appropriate to write laws to right that wrong to prevent the oppression mm -hmm. from continuing? And then, so would sure, there I be some room there to do that? Or when is that too much or too far? Yeah, that's why I'm glad I don't make laws. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's tricky stuff, um, for sure. I think it's situational and conditional, for sure. Um, is the group actually being oppressed? Uh, are they being denied freedoms that other people are being given? Uh, and are they being denied that on the basis of something that they can't control? Uh, I, I think that's sort of the pieces you have to look at, you know, based on sexuality, race, creed, where you were born, accent, whatever. Um, you know, I don't think you can write laws to uh, denigrate or hold on high uh, a certain demographic of people just because they're that demographic of people. So then in the, the writing of laws is really not the issue. It's a, it's a correct me, it, it's a, a matter of what the basis of those writing laws are. Uh, you just went through a, a fairly yeah, sure. decent point of logic or, or logical process as opposed to um, looking at, uh, you know, starting with, a, with, with the Bible in, in case of Christianity, obviously, saying, well, what does God tell us we're supposed to do in this kind of circumstance and in developing the law that you think is appropriate to that, right? So it's the basis for the laws. So a fair, a fair question for that side of the table, I think, would be, do you feel like it's fair or correct to create law based on religious value and morality? It, it depends on who you're talking to. If, if we go... I'm talking you know, to you. No, okay. <laughs> me, me, as I interpret the Bible, um, to make a law against a certain group because of their sexual, uh, I don't know the proper terminology, their se sexual preference, that I'm going to discriminate against them or I'm going to condemn them, that to me is not biblical. So that's, that's wrong. But on the other hand... Have you told... Pardon? Never mind. I'm sorry. If, if, you, if you come to me and I have a service and I say, well, I really don't want to do that for you because it goes against my beliefs, then I don't want to get thrown in jail or get a $100,000 lawsuit against me because of my beliefs. So I can respect you and, and your choices, but I don't want them to infringe upon me. And so then I don't want my choices to infringe upon you. The, the tricky part is when we start getting into government and schools, mm -hmm. You know, if you're going to come in and teach your agenda in school, mm -hmm. I have a problem with that. Ditto. Okay. And then the same thing with if for the other side of the table, if you, you send your child to school and they happen to be a certain way and the school teaches something that condemns that child, I think that is wrong. So, so do you feel like the, we talked earlier about the addition of under God into the pledge into the schools? Do you feel like that would be pushing an agenda that is of religious nature? So you would be against that? I believe, I believe our country was based on Judeo-Christian beliefs, and it's in the, you know, the, the founding fathers had that. You know, Jefferson, where he said that there's a great wall between church and state. You got to remember, these were Englishmen who just left England, where Absolutely. the king said, I am God, I represent God, mm -hmm. and so he took over the church. And so they really wanted to make sure that there was no church or state-based religion. I see that, but we've gone now to the so far where you, you can't talk any God in anything, they want to take it out of everything, out of government, out of schools, and 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 so, to me, that really doesn't matter. I really don't care. I, yeah, I really that don't that care. seems overstated. I mean, Jeff Sessions was just instructed to to uh, change the Justice Department to um, review laws based on twenty points uh, that basically follow that mm -hmm. that uh, idea set that uh, it's on. on a, 
God basis. I, I, I'm not just yeah, you know, this, no, you're, you can describe this a little better. Yeah, it's it's a little convoluted. Um, they try to make it as apolitical or as a, I guess, uh, religious as they could, uh, but it's very much a uh, he's been tasked with going through and looking at all these different rules and laws and saying, do they equate with biblical values? Do they equate with a Christian nation? Um, and I think you'll get a lot of people who would disagree with your incorrect history of the founding of the separation clauses. Um, not that they weren't religious or um, deistic or you know whatever type of uh, person they were, but that they actually saw the benefit of not allowing uh, a, a, a king or president to sort of dictate rule of law on a God told me to basis, right? Like we were just talking about earlier. It's much easier to do crazy things when you say, well, God told me, so there you have to go listen. Okay, let me, let me stop that there because we're going we're gonna to take up uh, are we a Christian nation as a different topic. It's obviously an important topic and a lot of people have. So you guys kind of made, made a stand. We'll Actually, so can that. I answer Ryan's um, question really quick? Go ahead. Kind of he went, because he was wondering about being a straight Christian male who didn't agree with homosexuality and why he was painted in a certain light. And I agree with Michael. Whether you voted a certain way or what you believe, I'm not going to I'm not gonna demonize you for that. But you, the, the straight white male who's against homosexuality enforces a particular status quo, which makes laws against gay people for being married, for being who they are, transgender people not being able to use restrooms, and it dehumanizes them. And I'm part of the LGBTQ spectrum as well, so it dehumanizes us. And it's that type of thinking that gets us on guard because despite however you disagree with our lifestyles or anything or orientations, preferences, you say it, we're still human beings. And whether you agree with what we do really doesn't matter. So that's my answer to that. Um. Okay, I have a, something else I want to add, but does, does anybody have a question they want to throw up? Go for it. Before I do that. All right, so as, as I mentioned before, the current statistics on, on um, the nuns are 24%. Now, if you look at the age breakdown, from age 18 to 29, that number goes up to 38%. Now, it looks like this is going to be a continuing trend, so that that 24% will, will increase. May or may not. There are some other factors, but... Probably, probably will. So my question to, 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 to you guys is that what, how does this affect your life and what will you do different in that kind of environment where, where um, the non-belief is growing significantly? Now, now, I don't see it as unrealistic because I mean, you look at some place like England where the, that number is somewhere around 80%, so it can, it's reasonable to expect that it'll continue to, to grow. How will it affect me? How does that change? How does that affect your life? What you do in life? Uh, that I mean, the balance of societies. Uh, do you just? It doesn't that's... affect me. I'll take it. Yeah. Um, it doesn't affect me personally, but it affects how I feel about other people. It makes me want to try and help them. Something like what we're doing here, trying to get them to realize a different viewpoint in how their life is going. I'll tell you a little story about um, my life growing up in a Christian family, a Christian home, went to school or church every day, or not every day, sorry, every week, um, things like that. Um, I never had that point where I wanted to rebel. That's not just, I'm not that type of person. I'm not a confrontational person. I'm not one to get up there and, you know, say, well, oh, someone told me don't do this. Well, I'm immediately going to go do that. I never had that disposition. So uh, I grew up in um, a church and then I became a leader in that church. And when I became a leader, I started, you know, uh, reading a lot more, doing a lot more studies. And I also had a, uh, what is what we called a core group of kids. And, you know, seventh grade guys. I started with seventh grade guys and we moved throughout the years, you know, uh, learning together and doing fun stuff together, youth group type stuff. And um, I always had a few kids who were like that. They were very rebellious. And even my best friends, super rebellious too at that point. And every once in a while I'd see them, you know, not show up for a few weeks or anything like that. And then they would come back. Um, I'd say, hey, you haven't been to church in a while. What's going on? You know, it's been like seven months. How's life going? We'd have lunch together. We just love it again. That's what I really want to um, 
pinpoint is the love aspect. The love aspect is I'm not trying to sit here and judge anyone by what they believe or anything like that. I just want to see what's going on with their lives. So when I sit down and have lunch with them, they would always say, oh, yeah, you know, life's going really crappy. You know, this is going on. That's going on. My parents are, you know, pissing me off and all this stuff. And it would always come back to the question of, well, how's your walk with God? How is God affecting your life at all? And they go, ah, man, I haven't been to church in a while. Well, hey, why don't you come to church? You know, and they start getting back into those faith-based things. And life would start suddenly getting a little bit better, you know, a little bit better and things like that. And so, I'm sorry, I went off on a tangent so, there. So what you're <laughs> saying basically, though, is you, it's pretty much the same thing that Larry said, which is you wouldn't change. I mean, you would... You would do the same outreach that you're doing now. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, under, under an environment maybe, where, maybe, where half the population was, maybe was a nine. change my tactics a little bit. Maybe try and see. Um, a li- I'm not a big statistic person. Whenever someone throws out statistics at me, it doesn't really mean a whole lot to me because those statistics don't really matter in the grand scheme of things. I think, again, trying to understand the way someone feels is more important than any statistic. I, I will agree and disagree with you on that it's because <laughs> um, you're right. I think what, what Larry has said, you can kind of, to some degree, find opposite statistics, especially with uh, groups that are out there creating statistics on both sides uh, with a particular intent. Um, but there, there is an accumulation of, of data that, and trends that, that are actually really there. Sure. So, yeah. Was this the United States? Yes. The, okay. the PRI study yeah, was okay. U.S. Yeah. Okay. Now, well, what Jen d- d- described earlier, the Zuckerman stuff, that was international. International? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And, and the Pew Research stuff is international I didn't get well. any of those <laughs> documents, by the way. I didn't? No. Okay. Well, you've got, you can see my thing. This I, is, <laughs> yeah, I've been kind of looking and glancing <laughs> over. Yeah. <laughs> Well, Actually, what's when we that? take a break here, I'll let you look at, through cool. all of them, or, or just feel free anytime. Yeah, that's fine. Let's see what's there. In terms of the, it raising any questions. But back to your back to your question, like, would I do anything different? No, I think exactly what I'm doing is addressing the trend that we're seeing. Do you think it would be? I'm sorry, did I hear. Uh, would, 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 your, your, so? would your would um, your daily life, I guess, not not necessarily your religious life in your church, uh, but would your daily life be affected any by? Um, a rise in circulation to that 70-80% number like he was talking about. <sighs> this is where it gets into a problem is if it's like China where they outlawed religion mm-hmm. and then they persecuted it. Yeah. Okay, well, that's... Yeah, which is goes, not secular. If it goes there, if it goes there where they're persecuting sure. the, the, the people for their belief, that's... That, same, that, same thing Soviet Union did. Right, so it'd Absolutely. be on the other end persecuting yes. somebody for not having faith or whatever. Yes, Agreed. I think that's bad on both sides. Yep. Uh, for me personally, how I, how I am led to do it is to go do what I'm doing now. I'm, I'm teaching the Word of God as I believe it is and, and really the misnomers that have been taught. There are so many people out there who are angry at the church because it's, it's condemned them or it's condemned a child or, you know, a pastor getting up on Sunday and saying something about you know, a homosexual is going to go to hell. Take him out of the pulpit. He, he has no business being there because, number one, that's not biblical. That's not what your job is. And uh, I think that's why we've got a whole society of people who are rebelling against that, what I would call, I use the word, denominational church. Yeah. Yeah. It's because they, they ostracize, they judge. When the Apostle Paul says, I don't judge any man according to his flesh. In other words, I don't judge anybody according to their actions. Because that could be somebody who's in pain, somebody who's hurting somebody. Who, you know, you, are you going to go out and condemn somebody who's an addict? Oh, you're going to hell. Oh, what did that do? Mm-hmm. Why did they get there? See, I'm I'm all about what was it that got you into that that hurt, that pain where you're abusing alcohol or, or you know money or sex or whatever it is that you're you have an unhealthy thing with. Mm-hmm. Let's go back and look at the heart issue that got you there and. The denominational religion doesn't do that. They just condemn. They just condemn. I, th- I think you're doing yeah. psychology. Con- you're right. Pardon? <laughs> I think you're doing psychology <laughs> yeah, at this point. What do you point. think psychology I mean, is? I mean, I, that's what I'm saying. That's yeah. exactly it. But you you removed the you removed the God component from that discussion. Not at all. But no, I'm saying if you do, if you remove the God component from that discussion, it is secular in its nature and it's secular psychology. I mean, you just define how to take care of people well 
by knowing how they behave, what they need, what they want, what exactly, got them there. And that's exactly what my Christianity that I okay. that I that I study and I believe that's how it operates. So when so the way you practice is obviously probably different from Ryan and many others. Do you reach out to other denominations and talk to them about these differences that you have? When they let me in the door and don't call me a heretic, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. That happens to you too? No. Because <laughs> we get it all the time. Yeah. But like, no, you know. it's... <laughs> and, you know, I, I know you guys don't want to keep hearing about religion or, or, or my biblical beliefs or whatever. No, I'm just trying to stay on the topic. Though. The yeah. topic. But, no, I, I was just at a... Uh, a church in Redlands. They invited me to come over and do their Wednesday service. It was an all-black church. And they don't, they, they heard me say things that they'd never heard before. And they were like, wow. And the pastor has invited me back. We have, I have now a relationship with that pastor. It's when you come in and you love people. You love them. That's how you, that's the open door. It's when you come in and condemn them or say you need to do something or you need to, you know, fly right or whatever. That doesn't work. And anyway, I could just preach so much. So it, it, you've, you've always, it sounds like you've always had this method this from, from the beginning. No, not, not at all. I was the most judgmental kid in the world. And no, I mean, from once you, were, once you became an active Christian um, or a pastor. It's been a growth. It's been a, probably the last nine years. I, I would call it grace. I use the word grace. And it's, there was really a revelation. And, and once there's a filter taken off your eyes and you start reading it, I'm going like, well, why are we doing this? It says we're not supposed to do that, that that's, that's a different covenant. So there was a great revelation. So I spent nine years unlearning what I learned as a kid in the church. Okay, so you, you did this because it made sense for you, not because you were trying to, in this case, work against a secular it, it To me, it says it. It was very black and white. It was okay. like, that says that, and that's what that <laughs> means. And, and um, whenever you get man in the middle of it, especially religion, it always gets tweaked. It always gets, you know, for somebody's benefit. Being a man-made thing, though, as you were saying earlier, it sort of is inherent in the process, right? I mean, you have to have people involved or there is no religion, right? Like, I mean, if we all disappeared tomorrow, Christianity would be gone. Right. Like, it wouldn't be a thing anymore. And if we all appeared two years from now from scratch and history ran its course again, we very likely would not come up with the same religions. So I'm, I'm really curious in how not incorporating man is actually functional for that it's a man's a man's interpretation so a man comes along and he says oh it says here that this and this and this is bad we should stone people so usually what they'll do is they'll take a scripture or a thing and they pull it out of context and now i'm going to use that and that's what we're going to live on mm -hmm. okay so in the in the 1920s we outlawed alcohol and all the church people are out there saying down with alcohol. I don't see anywhere in the Bible where it says drinking sure. is is bad. It talks about being a drunkard. Mm -hmm. Also talks about being a glutton and being fat is not good for you. So they took some concept and decided to make their man-made law, which is not a biblical law. It wasn't a good interpretation. I say the, the terminology <laughs> I use, it was a self-righteous Look at me! I don't do this, and you do it. So we're gonna we're gonna persecute you and make you toe the line the way we think. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Um, I'm gonna quote uh, Kevin McCaffrey again in, in his book. Um, he says the reason for the populism of religious indifference can be traced to different causes, and he lists um, occupational niches. Now he's going back hundreds of years here just specializing versus uh, like everybody in the community being farmers and things like that. Protestant reformations, constitutional and bureaucratic separation of church and state, the rise and spread of public education, emphasizing science and multiculturalism, the spread of uh, dense urban environments, access to the internet. All these forces are in effect and have been effect historically. So. I'm trying to come up with a question on this. So, so how how do you see? You know, does to me it seems like that's just going to continue. Wouldn't it seem that way? If you're referring, I don't know where you, what you're referring to. Like, uh, he's a sociologist. So. Okay, um, we had in history from the cross to the 1500s, we had one church. 
and it was jacked up as jacked up could be. And then we had Martin Luther come in and do his thing, and we had a breakaway. And we've had breakaway and breakaway and breakaway from that, which was a heavy man-made religion, which was, I would, in my biblical terms, I would say it was temple worship, which goes back to Judaism, which we're not supposed to be involved in. And so we've been on this path of breaking away from the old church, which I'm happy to see. I'm not upset with that at all. Um, I think there's biblical references to that that say that this is going to happen. Okay. So, I mean, again, all those forces. I know you want me to, I, you know, I no, know I'm you not want sure. me to I'm argue not, with no, you. No, I don't. I'm, I'm just trying, I'm trying to find a question in here, I guess. And maybe you guys can jump uh, in if you I, see, if you. I mean, on going. the point of what's, what's causing it um, and, and it's causing the acceptance of it, I, I do agree his statement of the internet um, and focus on science are two huge components of that. Um, to be able to sit down now and say, we, we've collected a body of work of science to where we understand how a lot of things work, where we had to apply those concepts to sort of a bronze aged best guess um, it is definitely going to denigrate that, um, you know, type of really religiosity. Um, I think access to the Internet and access to books is something you know, access to books, especially is something we've seen historically that religious groups do not want. Um, book burnings and saying you can't read these things and outlawing certain materials uh, because they countermand or disagree with those religious edicts. Um, now the internet, you can't stop that. You can't go burn the internet. So everybody can get up and they can go ask those questions and they can do their own research and they can work on is this thing logically plausible and does it actually work when I purport it to reality or is it just stuff that's out there that we've been using for a long time? Uh, and, and I feel like that's a huge piece of the conversion. I, I, I will add to that that it's not that simple. Because, no, absolutely not. You know, because you have you have information on both sides. You have creation science in, in particular, which is putting out a very large amount of new information. I think that's a horrible um, term, but okay. <laughs> uh, but but so, yeah, I, so, I agree with so you. So there's there's yeah. right, you know you both sides sort of. Right. It's kind of like this forum in a way where both sides have their opportunity to to. Uh, that's of equally accessible information. And you have to know how to do the research to do it because you just can't yeah. find one link and be like, oh, let me go find InfoWars or something. It doesn't work that way. You I've, have to you you have to be able to look at, you know, where these publications are coming from, where they're, you know, are they legitimate? Well, let's look at the consensus. There's a lot of information out there that can be, you know, misconstrued and misapplied in so many ways. Yeah. So. I feel like that attitude of like, it's on the internet, ergo I found the truth. Right. Um, is definitely a problem. Mm -hmm. um, that is so the earth that, is flat, right? Not right. I mean, um. you can find that answer for sure. <laughs> I, I feel like use of the internet and use of faith are very similar because they're both good tools to get to bad answers. Um, you know, they're not necessarily reliable ways to get to a truth. Um, I can go on the internet and I can find good information and bad information. I can have faith in your religion or I can have faith in Islam. And I think you would agree that both faiths are not um, contingent. They, they would not work together. So using faith as that process to get there is not a good idea. The same way that just using the internet because Google said so uh, is, is not a good answer either. The word, the word you use the word faith means I, I believe or I trust. You can trust Billy Bob to work on your car. Sure, I don't. I don't think. I think you know, also so, that's not the faith we're talking right. about. I'm, I'm not talking about. I have faith that this chair will be here when I sit right. down in it, or that my car will start, or right. those kinds of things. I think that is a educated assumption based on Absolutely. history. Uh, I mean faith, like that. His like Peter's faith, like that. That faith in the things that you can't show to be true. Uh, I, I feel like that is that sort of analogy. Um. I'm curious, this is a little off topic, but it just kind of triggered what you said. Um, let's just spend five minutes on the flat earth. <laughs> oh no. So well, technically we've been spending our whole lives on the flat earth. <laughs> this is true. <laughs> Kidding. So, okay, someone comes up to you and says, the earth is flat, uh, the, the, I read it on the internet, it makes sense to me. How do you then, go out and, you know, let's say that you have not heard this concept before. Okay, the cubic earth, because there's those two. So whatever. How do you evaluate? What's your, what's your process? Um, well, with anything, I tend to, and I, and I don't mean this to fall into that uh, fallacy, but I tend to go to authority. 
Um, I tend to go to people who are authorities in that field, people who know the science and the research uh, in those areas. And I, I would start there. Well, the flat I, earth people sure, I would start with, have authorities. Well, for those, I would start with physicists. I would start with cosmologists. I would start with even mathematicians because geometry is going to be pretty key to showing that this isn't true. Um, I, I would start to work out if this thing was not true, uh, what would the world look like? And that's how I think you determine if something's falsifiable or not. If it's not true. Well, the Flat Earth authorities yeah, have If, if Flat Earth were true, certain things would occur, right? And those things don't occur. And so when you start to look at it, you know, um, I, I'm not super versed in the, in the Flat Earth uh, argument, but the concept would be if the Earth was flat, we would see certain things or we would see certain behaviors. Um, types of uh, astronomical phenomenon would occur or not occur. Uh, in, in one of these two scenarios. And when you apply the things that you see in reality to the theory, when the, what you see in reality does not match the theory, then you throw the theory because this is not actually coming out to be true in testing. Okay, so we've got three pieces now. We've got the flat earth authorities, the not flat earth authorities, sure. and then we've got your personal judgment. How, that's what you just described. I think not, so not personal how, judgment, how, how more, more so evidenced uh, well, your conclusion is going to be based on the information that you've studied. So even closer to the mic, sorry. Yeah. So if he were to look at the information from the flat Earth side and that side, he's right. There's going to be evidence. There's going to be certain things that are going to be happening if their theory is correct or you know whatever. You know, you know. I think that's what he's trying to say. I, it's interesting. So, uh, <laughs> not quite the answer I expected, which is why I, why I find it interesting. Uh -huh. So I'm going to go back over to here now. So same same question. What's the problem with somebody who's deceived? Uh, okay, a person comes up to you and says they're the deceived. Is it, it's they, you know, how, do you, how do you determine if they're <laughs> deceived? That's kind of a well. Concern. Anybody who says it's a flat Earth is like, hey, I've been and I've been far enough up into the atmosphere. I've seen the curvature of the Earth. I've seen that personally. Okay, so, so you just. You're I've seen that. It does that. And so that alone is enough. And, and like you said, the science of a flat earth, it, it wouldn't work. Mm -hmm. Okay. We would have to do away with gravity. We'd have to do away with this. Yeah, there's a whole bunch of concepts that wouldn't fly. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. Okay. And Ryan? We'll, I was going to actually say the, say the same thing. I've been up in the atmosphere a uh, long enough and be able to see that, that I could just say, no, it doesn't exist. And, you know, you can... It, whoever is believing in this weirdo theory, which I think is way off topic, um, is that... <laughs> probing your brain. <laughs> no, that's fine. Um, is that I can just say, no, I can, I can bring them up into an airplane and show the curvature of the earth to them. How can they dispute that? And if they start trying to dispute that, then I can go, well, you know what? Then we're going to agree to disagree because you cannot rationalize with someone that delusional. Yeah, I think personal experience is not a good measure for what's true. Um, really? A, a lot of people have Isn't tons, that what science not, is, tons, though? Absolutely not. It's not a personal experience. It is a testable, repeatable experience. It is something By that who? you can go do. You can go do it. I can go do it. She can go do it. If you can send somebody up and they can see it, fine. I don't think it's a good basis of an argument, though, to say this is something I've experienced. Ergo, you're wrong. I, but I don't if think you can fair. repeat that and show other people, isn't that actually science? Isn't that repeating? That would begin to. Yeah, yes. absolutely. Yeah. For okay. sure, yeah. Okay. Do do taking them up, doing the multiple, yeah. Okay. For sure, that's interesting. I'll just I just want to find. It's I, I'm kind of fascinated here that we're basically in agreement by <laughs> by saying that that the the primary source of evaluation is our our own personal judgment. I, I find that interesting. Personal experience, maybe. Okay. So okay. So experts, be damned. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> on both sides of the argument. A little experiment there. Um, uh, if, okay, question, open question. Does modernization, and we're talking about scientific knowledge, the, the volume of human knowledge uh, collectively as it, as it continues over time, the use of technology and easy access to information lead to secularization? Say that one more time, sorry. Does modernization mm -hmm. in general lead to secularization? I think so. I, I tend, tend to lead it, tough. trend to trend in that direction. 
I mean, I guess it may because you are going to get access to a body of knowledge that you're going to be able to say, this is a definitive way for us to treat other human beings in a way that is good for society and allows us to thrive. Um, in that sense, yes. I think access to the modernization information, technology and things, I think more so that's going to more directly push people out of a religious concept of things of, I don't know, ergo God. Um, I, I, that's what I feel sort of the access to information does to you. I don't think being atheist or non-religious necessarily pushes you towards secularism. Um, I, don't, I don't think it has to. So I don't think access to the information necessarily is going to build secular societies. D define in that sentence, secular versus atheist. Um, well, secularist is somebody who believes that you should not be defining, well, modern definition of secularism is we should not be building rules or law sets based on someone's religious point of view. Um, everybody should pretty much be able to live by the same rules, whether or not, you know, and it's not a, and it's not a God rule. It's a, we decided this because it's a useful thing for humanity. Um, okay. uh, atheism is simply the lack of belief in gods. Okay. This side. I think it can lead to it, um, but at the same time, it really depends on the person themselves, whether they want to well, side with yeah, one way or the other. Because I'm, I'm really asking on sort of a broad, okay, a broad? like a, a broad global level. Because yeah, I mean, you can talk to anybody and, and they'll end up on any other side because there's just so many variables right. on an individual, so. I'm trying to word my question, if you want to take it first. It, I'm, I'm gonna sound like a broken record. It's, it's gonna come back to what is the people from my, my side, the Christians, what are they teaching? If you're teaching something that separates people, if you're teaching something that's contrary to science, I really don't have a problem with science. I, I like science. I'm, I'm fascinated by the stars and, and the creation and, you know, what we can look up there and see. I don't think they necessarily have to be exclusive from, you know, separated from each other. Uh, the problem is when you go back in the history of the church, they have stood on certain things that were just nuts, you know. Um, and so they made a, a, a truth from what they believed and science came along and said, well, no, that's not true. The earth is not the center of the universe. You know, the earth goes around the sun and so those kind of things. So I would not say that necessarily more information is bad. I would go back to say uh, from my, on my side of the table that if you teach the truth, they can receive it or not receive it. I don't think it necessarily is going to, just because there's more knowledge on the internet that people are going to say, oh, there is no God and run over there. I think if we present God in a bad way that we've done for the last 2,000 years, yeah, that side of the table is going to grow and grow and grow. If we present it correctly, I think this side will just do just fine and, and take care of itself. I'm going to be on the odd position of defending the Roman church here for a second. Because yeah, you said that they were nuts about not thinking the earth was the center or was the sun <clears> the center. <throat> To them at that point in time, that seemed like a very reasonable thing. That was their natural philosophy had taken them to that point of sure. view. What they were resisting was the change from that. So, you know, the modernization, the, ad, the additional scientific knowledge, which was at that point had data for it because Galileo was seeing the moons of Jupiter, et cetera, um, was reason to give up that idea that the Earth was the center and um, they resisted it for literally 350 years. So it's like they, it, see, it was a very rational position that they had before. But why did the church have that position? You'd have to ask Kelly see, there was, there was what actually, the Bible said. There was no reason for it because it's not a biblical thing where we're going to say that the earth is the center of the universe, that, that everything circles around the earth. That was a man coming in and say, well, this is what it should be. And then science came along and said, well, actually it's not. And even some of the, the, the precepts that you guys have today on the science end, that could, they could be totally changed in 10 years, 20 years, 100 years. Science is always evolving as we learn more. Now, there are certain scientific facts that will not change, but there's a lot of them that have changed, and they've changed drastically in the last 10, 15, 20 years. All right. Well, you kind of skipped my point. But Go back to your point. <laughs> well, I mean, the idea that... that um 
you know, that, that the Bible didn't teach, I don't know offhand, that it didn't teach it was the center of the universe. That seemed to be people's interpretation of what it was teaching at the time. So a man's maybe interpretation. That's a, maybe it's that's who, a, whoever is presenting those ideas, I think, is really what happens, is what their agendas are, then that's going to come across as what is fact to them. You know, again, just like with all these facts and things like that, I can go and find on the internet opposing facts to any argument whatsoever, like this stupid flat earth thing. You know, this was something that was Ill irrefutable for a long, long, long time, up until what, about six months ago or somewhere around there, where it just kind of started happening. Everyone started getting crazy and thinking, yeah. oh, the earth is flat now. That's because someone on the internet went, no, oh, no, you know what? I think something differently and they pushed their agenda and then they started putting it on the internet. Again, it's whoever presents these ideas. They are push pushing their personal agenda. And Larry and I, what we're talking about is we're trying to push God's agenda more than anything else. Wait, so, we're trying to take ourselves wouldn't, out wouldn't it, of the wouldn't agenda. Wouldn't it be ba based on the strength of the, uh, of the, of the um, point that's being made? I mean, granted, people can get out there and push something to be a celebrity, and that's another thing. Right. But, you know, these people are, you know, like if like a 9-11 truth or something, they're, they're pushing what they believe they have evidence for. Right. And it's a very small majority when it's something like that. Um, and, you know, a lot of the stuff, there's just not enough either knowledge or time. <laughs> Um, or there's enough people on the opposite side saying, no, you're crazy. You know? Yeah, well, that's the problem because then that's in that kind of environment, which we're all living in, then how, do, how does the average person begin to evaluate? And I'm going to stop talking. <laughs> <laughs> I think it might be personal experience. We, bringing it back to um, something like the flat earth, you know, we can show someone, we can bring them up into the atmosphere and say, no, look, it's curving. There's no flat side. We can fly around it. And, you know, that's a personal experience. And that can show someone instantly, oh, you know what? Maybe I'm wrong. Okay. Uh, okay, moving on. Does anybody else have a question that hasn't been asked that's off, off their paperwork or I in their question. minds? Just out of curiosity. Go for it. Um, just in the Inland Empire alone, there's multiple atheist, agnostic, free thinker groups, um, you know, that have developed in the last 10 years or so that are doing great work, whether they're doing speaker series, series like this, where it's open dialogue or outreach, um, charity events. And a lot of those, these type of things, you know, um, the church had that in the bag, building community for people. You had a hard time. The church was there to bring food. Hey, you know, you got a shoulder to cry on. Now with the rise of secularism and, and these secular groups doing the same thing, you know, um, just kind of curious what you guys think about that. Do you, do you guys, do you see that as a threat? No. Do you, just do your thoughts on that? Just because I particularly run one and I see organizers from various ones here that are doing amazing work every day. Um, That's people helping people. That's being right. a nice person. There's nothing wrong with that at all. I don't think it is a threat at all either. You don't feel to the congregation, though, as I, I'm going to use congregation in quotes, um, or to the church, that if people start to find that their needs for things like Jen was mentioning are met sort of without the God concept, right? It's like uh, going to a, a needy country and building wells but not giving out Bibles, right? Like skipping that part, like the help helps, right? Like giving the help. Um, do you feel like that will affect... I guess your outreach, your mission, things like that. Maybe is that more? Yeah. And do you see that maybe we're not as bad as most people see us? It's like generally, I don't think I've ever come across. Sees who? Um, I think for the most part. No, no. Who sees who? Huh? Sees who is bad? Us. The, those of us that identify as who atheists. Is, who is us? The non-religious. The non-religious. And this is what I'm trying to say. Okay. Atheists, okay. secularists, non-believers. We tend to be painted in a very negative light where even atheists don't want to even, even identify as atheists because devil worshippers, whatever, whatever. It's all nonsense. Um, do you, when you see us do this and you see Phil and he does the outreach and he does all this great work, does that change the stigma around us? Or do you, or is there still a barrier that you guys, I, and I'm not saying that you guys particularly do, but you know but others do see us in a certain light. What, whatever you're doing to help your fellow man is fine and dandy. That's, that's great. 
Um, I think what has happened in our country, which is more devastating, is we've, we've looked to the government. Mm -hmm. And the government has taken on all these giant charity roles, and they really are horrible at doing it. And uh, they're very wasteful. And uh, they usually don't get anybody out of their situation. They just perpetuate them in their brokenness or whatever their, their needy thing is. So, um, no, I, have, I don't feel threatened by it whatsoever. Wouldn't that be more of a conservative issue than a religious issue? Which? What, what, the, the opinions you just said about the government? <clears throat> well, and remember, everything I'm going to say is going to come from my belief in the biblical perspective, whatever. We're supposed to take care of, biblically, we're supposed to take care of the church people first and secondary, secondary anybody outside the church. The church should be clothing people, feeding people. It shouldn't be the government's job because they're really bad at it. So, But that's an opinion about the government being really bad, but the church is supposed to do that, and the church hasn't done it to the level they are supposed I, to have done it. There, I, that's a, I think that's a good point because, yeah, I mean, the, the government – just without getting into politics too much here. I worked in the welfare department. Okay, I, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I say, saw I mean, the it, it, insanity it, that it went on there. If it doesn't get done, that's when it gets pushed toward yeah. toward somebody do it. So nobody right. wants to do it. So the government, right? And then that can go too far. But again, it's not a religious topic so much as as a church. It's it's a more of a conservative topic than a religious topic. Anyways, also um, uh, really quick, ahead. Jen, when you were saying at the very end there, you were talking about how. Um, we are viewing you as the atheist group, uh, terrible people and heretics and devil worshipers and all that, that you can now see the side that we're on as well. We get viewed as the same thing. We're not sitting here saying fire and brimstone, you're going to hell and all this stuff, but that's the way the world views us. And so there is a commonality between you and I where we are sitting here going, well, that's not how we're working. That's not how we're trying to show other people that's what we But we, we do have the Westboro Baptist Church that does do that. Oh, yeah. They're, yeah. they're crazy don't really have all over the place. Yeah. They're not, they're there's not also devil worshipers and stuff like that, <laughs> yeah. you know? So, like, there's on both yeah. sides, you know, I'm just saying they don't just pre- um, assume that every Christian you come across is going to be that crazy type of person. You know, yeah, there's the, you know, the God hates, you know, gay people type of people. Yeah, I've met them too, and I disagree with them. I used to go to L.A. every year for E3, and I would see people picketing saying, God hates gamers and stuff like that. <laughs> and I was like, what are you talking I about? I think there's a biblical principle there. <laughs> that might make more sense, actually. <laughs> and I would see this, and I would go up and talk to them, like, you're going about this all wrong. Like, you might be a Christian, you might believe in the Word of God, but you're doing it in a completely different and inappropriate way. I'm not the evangelist type of person. I'm not the soapbox person. Like I said, I just want to hang out with people and show the love of God more than anything else. And yeah, I can get heated. I can have some incorrect thoughts and approaches to these things. But again, we're not always going to be those crazy, you know, fire and brimstone type of people that, you know, the world believes. I mean, even on The Simpsons, you can see they go to church, but what church are they a part of? They're not Christians, I can guarantee you that much, you know? So just, again, just have that mindset of, yeah, you know, not all of these people are going to be, you know, trying to condemn you. And I definitely am sitting here saying, I'm not trying to condemn you I think not you making blanket statements about a group is good, not right. to individualize right. anything, right? But it's also good to... Um, realize that you're you're not remotely especially in this country um in an equal position to a non-believer um right. the pre-concepts that come along with being a non-believer in the sort of modern christian america is not remotely equatable um for you to go to pretty much anywhere in the country and be able to say i'm a christian and i go to this church is going to be met with far different reactions uh than I don't believe in God. I think religious and stuff is nonsense. Like that is that is a f far cry of. I feel like in anymore it's starting to get easier to come out um, from the LGBTQ spectrum than it is to come out from the religious non-affiliation spectrum. So I, I do not feel like those two things equate. Right, and you'll see a lot of the atheist movement branching off the coming out of the closet type of mm -hmm. thing. We're we're actually falling on the coattails of that and being a little bit more because we're still at risk of being ostracized from our families 
losing as well, jobs. losing jobs. <laughs> I mean, those are even for me in my current position, you know, there's a lot that I, I would have to be um, mm-hmm. worried about. But I do want to get clarification a little bit from you. Um, Larry, you said that the goal was to help everybody in your church and everybody else. So if somebody so if I came to you and I needed help, I would be secondary to just people of your church. Is that is that is that it what would I heard? Always, it always is gonna come on the circumstances. So I have people Yeah, but I'm just a human being that's asking for help. I have people who come and knock on my door every day. I, I have a a door that says private office, they come knock on the door. Hey, they turned my electricity off, can you help me out? Okay, I have to make a decision. And um, for whatever you believe, you believe. But I have to stop and say, okay, Lord, what am I supposed to do here? And this is somebody that you want me to help, somebody you don't want me to help. And so my first thing is I take care of the people inside the church. Those are the ones that I help. And then if he leads me to do something for somebody else, I definitely will. There's, you know, we go through the, I live in the city of Redlands. And so I go out and I minister to the homeless people. I got homeless people living in my parking lot. And so, but I have to be, led on what I do and who I help because a lot of them are just out looking for a handout to to maintain their addiction or their brokenness or whatever. So I'm looking for somebody that I can help and bring in and fix the hard issue that is there that, that keeps them out there where they're at. Well just situation that's really difficult because I think that's just a judgment that, that you know, certain people, homeless people are a certain way only for these reasons. I think that's just that, that that's just being more judgmental. I guess my point was Why since, are I am, homeless? Science, since I am there what is the majority a, there, of the homeless there could people be out a there? Million reasons. Yeah. It could be mental health issues. It could just be, <clears throat> you know, a series of things. Who knows? And that's um, that's why it, it's hard to gauge. I guess my question more was if I had come to you and I needed some help and I wasn't part of your church, would I be turned away? Because no. your church comes okay. first. Okay. Um, I guess that was a clarification I was looking nine, for. I was just trying to, just to make sure. Nine years ago, uh, a young lady moved into my house. And um, she was uh, had an addiction, and she was in a lesbian relationship. So what does that have anything to do with her being... Well, you were just saying that I would turn you away because of maybe your beliefs or your... Uh, I'm not saying any given reason. I was just wanting just to know why... Your particular I, I, church. I would say, from we, your we, point of view, it, it actually need, sort of makes to sense. wrap up. So oh, let, let's okay. just Larry finish. Take, take care so of no, but to, to say I judge somebody, okay? I don't. I can't. I don't have the ability. I have a small church. I just don't have the ability. To everybody who knocks on the door, just you know, give them money or or help them. You know, I can send them to somewhere. So I have to be led on who I help. If this is somebody the Lord wants me to help, but the thing is saying about judgment. Uh, I have somebody that uh, she's she's like my adopted daughter, and so she's moved in. She lived with us for six and a half years. Yeah, never once judged her for for the for what I would say where she was at or what she was dealing with or whatever. And so no, there is no judgment. It's like if I go knock on your door, you're going to give me a dollar if I need a dollar. You might, you might not. You have to make a judgment. So. I wouldn't say that I'm judging somebody or putting them down or categorizing because yeah, that's I, all I was just wondering. yeah, and, yeah. I, and I'd say to yeah. a certain degree that makes absolute sense. Mm-hmm. I mean, you're running a, a, a I won't say a for-profit business, but you're running something that has finances. Like you're running something that actually has a budget, and you do have to be conscientious of where you spend that money and the decisions that you make to spend that money. I mean, that's that's your prerogative in that in that group. I think I've never turned a hungry person down. If anybody comes to me, it's an issue of I need food, they're going to get a meal, they're going to get something. Uh, If somebody has no place to live, if I can send them somewhere, I would do that. Um, But in my case, I would say the lion's share of the people I deal with, they've because of their hurt and their circumstances, there's also a substance abuse. And so I have to discern if, you know, am I just giving you money to go get high for the rest of the night or whatever? So i got to be wise in what I do. Okay. Let's leave it there. Um, I want to thank everybody for being here today. And if we could have a hand for everybody, please. Uh, I think we might have some good questions from the audience today. But first, we're going to take a break. We're going to have some of that Halloween candy over there that's left over. So come back in 10, please. <laughs>